my argument was, and it's highly supported by the, the data, is that you don't get equality of opportunity without possessing the knowledge that your group knows. It is Don's leadership in not letting us abandon the richness, the coherence, the depth of the daily work students do as the platform for their freedom and success that distinguishes him in the reform community. As people didn't see cultural literacy as a cognitive psychology book. Um, largely it seemed to be viewed as sort of a polemic for traditionalism. Uh, uh, and it, it's only been very slowly, and thanks to Don's persistence, that people have finally gotten around to understanding what, what his argument really is. What I heard is not a guy who cared only about dead white guys, but who cared deeply about the same thing I did, and that is poor kids and kids of color and getting them a quality education. What I wanted to do was to universalize elite culture. The event was, the, the precipitating event, uh, was my experience in a community college in Richmond where some research I was doing showed that these mostly black students didn't know really who Grant and Lee were. In, this was in Richmond. And I, I couldn't really grasp the meaning of Bruce Catton's description of Lee's surrender to Grant at Appomattox Courthouse. Well, you can imagine when we were analyzing the data and it showed that these kids could read very well when the subject was familiar, but didn't know about, here in Richmond, they didn't really know much about Grant and Lee. And I said, these kids have been cheated. There's something really strange going on here. And of course, they couldn't read generally anything that demanded factual background knowledge. Some days I, I like to think that Diane Ravitch and I discovered E.D. Hirsch as a K-12 uh, education reformer. Um, in the early 1980s, it must have been 82 or 3, um, she and I and the Educational Excellence Network that we were then leading, a kind of an antecedent to the Fordham Institute, we're putting on a conference on uh, human the state of humanities in American high schools. This is before a nation at risk. And uh, somebody tipped us off to an article in a relatively obscure, obscure scholarly magazine, indeed called The American Scholar, uh, by this University of Virginia English professor named E.D. Hirsch. And it was about K-12 education. And we had never heard of him and had no idea what he knew about K-12 education. But anyway, we read the article. It was fascinating. And we asked him if he would come and speak at our conference. Um, and he did. And um, as far as I know, this was the first sort of speech he had given based on the findings of this article. And we were blown away. And at the end of the conference said to him, in essence, you should write a book. Uh, and lo and behold, he wrote a book. Uh, and uh, cultural literacy came out in, in 1987. He was the first to show, or one of the first to show, the linkage between background knowledge, necessary background knowledge that kids uh, should start getting in, uh, as soon as they start school, in kindergarten, maybe even pre-K, uh, that would enable them to become better readers. And he, he showed as well that just getting more phonics, learning how to decode language while important, the, the, lang the written language, while important, and if you did it right, you could get some boost in the, in the later, latter grades. Unless you have the background knowledge, you won't get the, the reading comprehension. His research was absolutely foundational. His research, as we all know, shows the fundamental importance that knowledge plays, coherent knowledge in particular, developed within grades and across grades in developing the foundations of literacy that will enable students not only to read widely in those early years, but build the foundations they absolutely require to read increasingly demanding text in middle school and high school years. 
reading Hirsch, you know, we learn that achievement gaps are really knowledge gaps, which in a sense are really language gaps. Well, that's good news and bad news. It's it's tough for the poor poor kids who often, not invariably, but often are starting school at a great disadvantage compared to more privileged kids. But it's an opportunity because if we provide that background material that so many poor kids just don't get at home, uh, we can make up for those gaps. The whole point of the argument, you if you read cultural literacy, you remember the point of the argument, no, and it wasn't uh, to perpetuate uh, that culture of power, it was to open the door uh, to kids who in the United States, because of our schooling system, don't have access to that knowledge, to those keys to power, tools of power. And that to me was a pretty clear argument. Uh, it's also true. <laughs> that, so it, the question is, when, if ever, will it catch hold? Well, the book struck two chords. Uh, one of them was the kind of, uh, oh my God, chord of him actually having the uh, chutzpah to make a list of things at the back of the book. And so people were uh, agitated either positively or negatively. Almost nobody was neutral about the list, as it was known, uh, 5,000 or so items at the end of the book that were what every educated American should know. Well, you have to understand, when people bought the book, that was generally the only thing that they read was the list. It's, it's the notion of people take the most simplistic, oh, this is a list that someone wants kids to memorize. That wasn't Don's intent at all. His intent was these are the concepts or the facts that kids need to know to be able to um, um, have a level playing field going forward. So the list essentially became cultural literacy. and. It uh, didn't matter what the bulk of the book actually said and explained in a step-by-step -step logical way. Another thing I think we have to remember in talking about the list is that it's very different from the core knowledge sequence. That's another different thing that had a lot more teacher input as actually what belonged to the elementary school. The, the list was supposedly what schooling should teach you up through 12th grade. So there is this big difference between this cultural literacy list and the core knowledge sequence. Get that very clear. The core knowledge sequence is a cumulative, coherent, cross-curricular framework of rich content from preschool through grade 8. When we talk about content building um, coherently, we talk about things such as the fact that in kindergarten we have a unit on Columbus and the Pilgrims. And um, before we do this unit on Columbus and the Pilgrims, we do a unit on kings and queens because clearly um, understanding kings and queens will help students better understand Columbus because his voyage was initiated by King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella as they sent him on his voyage or his voyage was supported by King Ferdinand and Queen Isabella. Um, before we um, do the Columbus unit, we also do a unit on Native Americans so that students better understand who Columbus met when he arrives in the New World. And because the Native Americans were hunters and farmers, we do a unit on farming before we do a unit on Native Americans. And before we do the unit on farming, we do the unit on plants. So we coherently build the knowledge from plants and farms to Native Americans, and we also cover kings and queens, so that by the time we get to Columbus, um, students have this rich, supportive background knowledge that will help them better understand Columbus. When I became chancellor of the New York City Public Schools in 2002, is when I started to become increasingly familiar with E.D. Hirsch's work. And I guess what made me a fan of it is a basic idea contained in his thinking about the kind of knowledge that people need in order to become more and more sophisticated readers and learners. And it seemed to me that he was on to one of the fundamental truths as to why our nation was not making the kind of progress in reading that it ought to make. 
and basically it was because the curriculum was not designed in a way to prepare children for the rigors of deep engagement with complicated texts. And that became, as I served as Chancellor of New York, increasingly clear to me over the years that I was doing the work. The more I read, the more I learned, and then quite frankly, Don and Linda reached out to me and, and talked to me about would we like to partner with them? Because I think at first people thought the reading program we had adopted in New York was by no means a core knowledge program and maybe that was not the direction we wanted to go. But as I said, as I learned more and more about it, this became more and more interesting and I thought, why not test this out and really see? I mean, one of the things that you don't see in K-12 education a lot is people trying new and different approaches, testing them, and then seeing whether to expand them. And this was something a lot of people, people I respected, people who had been writing about it, Sal Stern and others, and I thought to myself, this was a real chance to find schools that were interested in trying it and to see what kind of results we could get. I am Principal Valerie Lewis. I'm principal of PSMS 124 a New York City public school. We've been a core knowledge school for 15 years. We have a high poverty rate in the school. We're at the 90th percentile of uh, free lunch. As a matter of fact, since 2003, we've never been recertified because of the poverty level. They just keep us at universal lunch. The federal government just consistently gives everyone free lunch. Over the 15 years, uh, we have found that even though the socioeconomic groups have changed, the demographics have changed, the one thing that stayed constant is the core knowledge has taken all children to be successful learners. And that has even impacted upon incredibly on our special education population and our ESL population. We're seeing a high rate of success for those children too where in the past it would not have been because every child ha now has something to say. They have, might have different entry points and levels of their um, ability to understand something but we're able to differentiate the curriculum in the core knowledge so that all children are actively involved. Don's view is that inequity can be described as an inequality of words and knowledge. That is, he dares to say that when we look at the ravages of poverty and other inequalities in our society, we must cast a sharp eye in the inequity of knowledge, in the inequity of words that are so closely tied to that knowledge, the building of that rich general knowledge, particularly in the earliest years, in pre-K and in the early years of schooling, are essential to give kids a foundation that they can equally contribute in their later learning and take advantage of their later learning. The absence of words and vocabulary um, is really the start of the achieving gap um, for kids um, who are two, three, four, and five. And so what Don was saying is, let's make sure that we have that kind of vocabulary. Let's make sure that in the earliest grades, kids are hearing and knowing things and understanding things, not in a developmentally inappropriate way, which unfortunately sometimes is how people take Don's teaching, but to make sure that we level the playing field so that kids that don't have books at home or don't have um, parents who are reading to them at night at home because their parents may be you know, working three or four different jobs that we find a way to level the playing field. So on the equity piece, equity is about how we give kids who have the least the most. How do we try to accommodate for what they're not getting right now so that we help level that playing field. And that's what Don's work wa is, was and is about. Hirsch was seen as one of these uh, right-wing reactionaries who wanted children to only learn, you know, about dead white men, you know. Um, in, in reality, as we know, he's, he's, he's Hirsch by uh, his politics. He's a liberal, a liberal Democrat. And it was out of a sense of, uh, of, of um, fostering equality and narrowing the achievement gap and bringing, uh, raising the achievement of minority kids and disadvantaged kids that he proposed this theory. And it's been a tragedy that there has never, that, that there's been this reluctance to see and understand the importance of it. When kids 
begin school, when they when they get to uh, kindergarten, uh, kids from middle class homes already have much more of this knowledge that we know is going to be important for literacy and numeracy than kids who come from disadvantaged homes. And so if you think that's true, then you think the schools have got to um, sort of try and make up for that deficit as best they can. Uh, uh, and it is, it's a knowledge deficit. It's not an accident that Don's book uh, from however many years, few years ago was called The Knowledge Deficit. That's what it's really about. When we talk about leveling the playing field, um, it goes back to something that we learned a long time ago, that if you make teachers curious and children curious and parents curious, you develop a community of learners. And that's what happened with core knowledge. Every curriculum should be a guide, not a straitjacket. It should be enough to help a teacher um, spark some ideas, put lessons together that, um, uh, that help the teacher differentiate instruction to the needs of each and every child um, in the areas that a teacher is teaching. And what core, the core knowledge curriculum has done is separate and apart from the fact that it's very much aligned to the common core standards, but what it's done is it brings life to history. It brings life to some um, uh, pieces of knowledge that we want kids to have and to make it you know, fun and exciting. It can't do that simply by a piece of paper, but it has lots, it's chock full of lots of different ideas and strategies that can bring life and joy and fun to a classroom or to a school. The Common Core Standards are, are like a beautiful vessel that doesn't have anything in it. Uh, by way of um, uh, like a g gorgeous vase that has no water in it. And uh, it's not going to nourish many flowers if somebody doesn't put water in it. So everybody knows it needs water. Uh, but the common core standards need something that is called content. They supply a very tiny fraction of it themselves and they avoid it for all sorts of reasons, avoided supplying more. Uh, core knowledge uh, is the right um, is the right water for that vase, and uh, it's not the only imaginable water for that vase. But it is so good, um, at least through eighth grade. I'm I'm waiting for him to do high school core knowledge. Uh, it is so good through eighth grade that it would be insane for a state or district or school that uh, is serious about Common Core uh, not to think about putting core knowledge into the vase. The standards are an elegant um, sort of framework, but they're not themselves clear on all the pieces of the curriculum that need to go along it. So if we don't combine both this elegant new framework with the kind of clear curriculum um, that kids need and work hard, especially in those early grades, on that all important vocabulary and background knowledge, then we're never going to realize the promise that's inherent in the standards. The, the reason a certain amount of recognition of core knowledge is taking place is that the ELA program that we produced over the last few years fits in very nicely with common core requirements. In fact, there's a mo they're a model for, for that, really. Uh, but the common core standards are not whole curriculum. You've got math and you've got ELA, but to, to implement ELA properly, you have to have the whole curriculum as a coherent curriculum because the whole curriculum is what really gives you mastery of language. This is a concept that hasn't, I think, been widely understood. You need to have social sciences, you need to have civics, you need to have science if you want people to be verbally competent because the background knowledge that's needed to deal with language involves background knowledge of these subjects. And so you need the whole curriculum, not just ELA, if, if you want to be good at ELA. I don't know how to get that point across. 
Don Hirsch has made a tremendous contribution uh, to American education. And as important as he is as a thinker, he's even more simply as a human being. He's a wonderful human being. And I have tremendous respect for his work, but I have an equal amount of respect for him personally. You've been an insp inspiration to me. You've taught me so very much. You've become a friend, and as you know, I'm a deep admirer of you and your work. Don, thank you for being engaged and involved through all the tumult and through all the ups and downs, and thank you for giving us your brain and your soul and the understanding that knowledge is power and that we can gain it and we can help teach it through a series of ideas that then become knowledge makers and knowledge knowers. Thank you, Don, for everything you've done. Well, American Education owes a huge debt of thanks to uh, Don Hirsch uh, for having a uh, lit a lamp that is shining brightly and is illuminating some uh, dark passages uh, and is showing a way forward. Don, I, I hope you know that not just me, but all of us at the Education Trust thank you for your work. We're indebted to you for adding to our understanding of what needs uh, to happen to make sure that low-income kids and kids of color actually have a fair shot in this country, and we will work with you till the very end to make that happen. Thanks on behalf of the entire field of education for your unbelievable tenacity in ensuring that your ideas did get a fair hearing, which uh, I and I know everybody else associated with you is enormously pleased that they have gotten a fair hearing and they've gotten a broader and broader audience. But like so many others, I also offer you personal thanks because you've been enormously influential in my personal career and in my way of thinking. So congratulations to you and again, I thank you. Thank you for giving the staff, the parents, the students, and the leadership of not only 124, but all of us that have been fortuitous enough to know core knowledge, study core knowledge, and also be able to carry your vision. You are our Don Quixote. Um, you batted windmills for a very long time, and your dream is realized and will continue to be realized because we are committed to your vision for now and in the future. And you have 15,000 little soldiers that have left PS 124 to date that will carry the word of core knowledge and your hard work. Um, you are admired, and I thank you personally for giving me the career that I never thought I would have because of this journey with core knowledge. What's remarkable about Don is the sense in which he is at once a lonely prophet and at the same time commands some of the most diverse allegiances of any figure in this country, whether it's in the homeschooling community or among unions of teachers, whether it's reformers or right and left. Don has helped us all appreciate the force of knowledge He's made us all uncomfortable, but at the same time ready to do more.